Welcome to the .NET Talk Show with your hosts, Cam Soper, David Pye, and not the Scott we deserve, but the Scott we needed, Scott Addy. The .NET Doc Show starts now. I missed that intro. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> I do love that intro. It's pretty amazing. Um, oh, yeah, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, good morning, maybe, potentially, to whoever's watching around the world. Uh, this is a special edition of the .NET Doc Show with... My co-host here, Cam and Scott, and our good friend, Lance Larson. Um, Lance, you're representing what? So Madison.net user group. Uh, we've been an awesome user group for about 15 years um, and uh, love having fantastic speakers like you, uh, David, who are absolutely one of our favorites. Um, Scott, Addy, and Cam are super nice to have you guys here helping out. And uh, we will have a fantastic show tonight. Um, and uh, beyond that, next month, we'll have uh, myself talking about uh, Oculus Quest and HoloLens. Uh, so join us for that as well. Um, so mad.net.com. And that's about it. Back to you, David. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to checking that out. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar with um, the intent of this show. So the .NET Doc show was born back at the end of February. And as a team, we decided to build out a website and we built the website and uh, it, it was a fun effort. And this is kind of a behind the scenes look into that development effort and where we are today. Uh, so I actually, I just put this slide deck together today. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with me, my name is David, David Pine. You can follow me on Twitter at DavidPine7. I maintain a blog at DavidPine.net. And if you're looking to see any GitHub or open source contribution stuff, it's all up on GitHub at iEvangelist. So the story, uh, and this is really like the why behind uh, the .NET Doc show, and really it was a passion project. And I, you know, Cam and Scott, feel free to jump in at any point in time here and uh, share your perspective as well. But the three of us had gotten together at a special little event uh, in Microsoft um, over in Washington on campus. There was um, DevRel Camp, and it's basically a celebration of. Uh, DevRel coming together and kind of t discussing the successes and stories and lessons learned from the year before. Kind and, of a kind of a mini conference kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, but it's internal to Microsoft, right? So just developer relations. And we um, at that point in time, I was actually transitioning over to or talking and discussions to joining uh, the .NET Docs team. I was working on the Azure Docs at the time. And one of the ideas that we had had was, hey, we should really look into this whole streaming uh, playground, if you will, because it's it's really, uh, it takes a lot of effort. And I mean, there's a lot of different aspects to it, like which hardware do you do? Like what what's the best setup? What software? You know, we were on OBS for a while. We switched over to StreamYard. We might be going to Restreamer. There's all these different things that you don't even really think about. Building out different social media accounts to manage and, um, and then one of the things that we said was, well, if we're going to do it, you know, the backstory was, let's let's just do it. Let's go all on, all in, and uh, ask for forgiveness and not permission. And that's kind of what we did, right? Like, uh, I think we're still asking for uh, permission now, uh, or forgiveness rather, right? But <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, is there anything you guys want to add to that? You're not. I, I think that was a uh, go ahead, I, Scott. I guess I would emphasize that we went into this really with no idea what we were doing. Um, the first handful of episodes were absolute disasters. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'm sure if you watched any of those first episodes, you wondered why Microsoft employs us. Uh, you might still maybe, wonder that now. <laughs> yeah, we've learned from the mistakes, and I'm sure David will uh, show some of the things we've learned along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's kind of the 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 why, right? The story behind it, and um, I like I mentioned before, I didn't really want to build a slide deck. So this is 
literally one of the last slides and it's the code, right? So we're going to jump into the demo. And that is really one of my favorite parts is kind of looking at the code and discussing it and the evolution of how this thing came to be. Um, and at any point in time, uh, our, our good friends Cam and Scott are watching the chat and Twitch. And this is a new platform um, from what you're probably accustomed to with the virtual aspect. So uh, Lance had mentioned you guys were using Google Meet before. So unfortunately, you can't share your video, but you can ask questions and we encourage you to ask questions. And as you ask those questions, um, Cam and Scott will help out and we'll make sure that they get addressed. But at any point in time, if you see something uh, you're curious about or want to double click into, let's have that conversation and, and be collaborative that way. Um, so I've got Visual Studio Code, or sorry, Visual Studio opened here. And if you, uh, the first question I want to ask to everyone, is this a good font size? Uh, actually, we can probably make this the full screen. Let me see, click. Um, is this a good uh, size? Can everyone see that pretty well? I want to make sure that it's a good experience from your end. It looks good on my end, Dave. Okay. Um, so one thing you're going to notice first and foremost is I want to give a shout out to Mads uh, Christensen. He actually created what is called presentation mode for Visual Studio. So I have that installed as an extension and you'll see that here. Uh, presentation mode allows you to kind of disconnect your account settings from uh, uh, the presentation mode instance of Visual Studio. And that's why you get like this little demo banner up here and you can specify, uh, you know, a high contrast um, theme and you can bump up the font size and stuff like that. And it's great for presentations. So this application is, uh, you know, multi-tiered. We have uh, many, many things kind of going on here, but it started off very, very simple. The application uh, just kind of grew and evolved. And when we first started doing it, we made a decision to use Blazor uh, server side and uh, we'll have a link for that. Uh, someone can probably throw that in the chat, but we have a link at the end I'll show. Um, but so Blazor, uh, Blazor server side is different from Blazor WebAssembly in that uh, the Blazor uh, view engine basically is sits on top of just its razor. So you end up having um, server side rendering and that's, that's the way it, um, you know, a request over the web comes uh, from a client and then on the server, the page, the HTML is then rendered and then returned back. So that's the technology that we decided to go with. And it's very, very similar to MVC. Um, so it's not quite as sexy as the WebAssembly alternative to hosting where you end up with, you know, true um, WebAssembly bits on um, the client side. So, uh, so basically, I just did file new project and chose the Blazor uh, template. And then you get a bunch of kind of boilerplate stuff. And I like to update mine immediately. I don't really care for some of their templates. Some of the things that I did that I'll call attention to here is like, for example, inside the program, the main entry point, I prefer mine to be task based. So we actually make it, uh, there's alternatives to um, uh, the create host builder, which is just a local function right here. Um, the template actually shows up and it has this being public. So there's no reason for that to public be public. We can just make that a private uh, member. Um, and so basically it creates a default builder given these arguments and it can does some configuration things. We're gonna add Key Vault. Uh, Key Vault is uh, an Azure offering and it's a way to kind of secure uh, various secrets, and it's an easy way to share those secrets. So in Azure, I actually created uh, an Azure Key Vault resource, and it's just key value pairs that end up being encrypted. And with that uh, bit of configuration, um, we can actually share all of the credentials for the entire application amongst um, Cam and Scott and myself and uh, the Azure app service that's using it. So it's very, very uh, streamlined way to kind of work with configuration. Alternatives to that would be um, apps uh, or app secrets, I think it is, or um, like the app settings, JSON, or even environment variables. Uh, so we've got, uh, yeah, Key Vault set up, and then uh, we're specifying that we're going to use this um, builder right here. And uh, the web builder is going to use this startup. And it's very, very common nomenclature that you've seen with ASP.NET Core now for a while. And this has been just kind of the evolution of what was Owen uh, Katana years ago. So in here, we already have dependency injection 
um, working in the in the regard that we are able to get uh, an I configuration instance in to our constructor to the startup, and this is going to represent our configuration. This is going to hold things like I mentioned before, those key value pairs from uh, Key Vault, and then we've got two very very well known, well defined. Um, APIs here, that is the configure services and configure, and this should look very, very familiar to you if you've if you've done any bit of .NET Core or ASP.NET Core development. So in the service collections, we are gonna add application insights telemetry, we add authentication, um, and there's a whole bunch of things that we just kind of walk through and add, uh, controllers with views and memory cache and uh, server side blazer, and a lot of these things are actually kind of done for you from the template, so that's fine. Um, this is where you get to ingest into this um, this pipeline uh, the things that you would want to add, additional things. So uh, Signal R comes for us, uh, comes with server side out of the box because actually the way that the server side rendering works with Blazor is the the client requests the app, the app comes over the wire. And as parts of it need to change, uh, SignalR handles that workload and will actually communicate the deltas. And those deltas are what render updates on the, the DOM. So so Dave, let me let me ask a question just I think to, to illustrate the point. So mm -hmm. would you would you call it kind of similar to web forms in that regard? How how web forms is working with like a like a known like a like a known state and it's sending state back and forth across the wire. That's a very uh, old school way of doing things, but absolutely, yeah. And and it's ironic that such old technology um, is uh, still kind of like the general architecture of that uh, exists. In fact, there's uh, our friend C Sharp Fritz has been spending a lot of time actually upgrading a web form uh, application, which is a really massive one. Uh, to um, Blazor, I think he's doing the server side alternative. So yes, um, just note that it's a lot more uh, clean, a lot uh, you know more well architected. You get a lot of things like dependency injection, um, uh, and you know it, it's just a modern way of doing it, right? Uh, gotcha. You're you're not going to see like is uh, post back, right? <laughs> so so Which, so. Dave, just, and just a, just another question before I let you get back. So, have has has everybody in the audience seen the website? I mean, should should we like show that for like some context? Yeah, let me. I guess I can do that real quick. Let me press buttons. I also, uh, while Dave's doing that, I realized uh, we didn't really talk about what we do in our day jobs. Um, that might explain the name of the show, the yeah. .NET Docs. Uh, so the three of us actually work on the Microsoft Docs team. We all um, work on some aspect of .NET content. Um, and so the name, the .NET Docs, comes from, uh, it's really a play on words. We work on the documentation for .NET, and we would consider ourselves uh, subject matter experts or doctors, if you will, of .NET. So in keeping with that theme, you notice our mascot has this COVID-19 theme. He has a <laughs> mask on his face. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the additional context there. Um, uh, yeah, so the website, uh, this is what it actually looks like. And uh, we don't have a test environment or anything like that because uh, why why have fun if you're not going to really go all out? So T testing lot, in prod is fun. Yeah, a lot of our stuff is done in prod. We we have a single database. <laughs> we'll get into that. It's pretty neat though. Um, but uh, yeah, so we've just borrowed um, some of the ideas were influenced uh, for the design itself was influenced from um, the card layout that you would see with uh, like the community standup that's been around for you know five or so years now. And they'll have something very, very similar to this where they kind of have the title, they've got the date, they got a little blurb about it. They have the social media links, right? So this is how you would get to Heather's Twitter account. Uh, we've got different like categories here or pseudo categories. Everything is um, you know, .NET based, but uh, we'll actually call out the fact that um, Heather's an MVP right, or, or Ed's an MVP, and then we've got various information about them. So you click on that and you'll go to Ed's public profile for the MVP stuff, which is really, really cool. And I think my internet is having difficulty here. Keep dropping frames, trust me, it works. <laughs> um, and then we've got uh, basically um, 
too long, don't read articles for each of these. And these are dev twos where we'll kind of uh, highlight various bits of uh, the show. And uh, a lot of it's been just a work of, of passion and excitement. And um, so, yeah, it's really coming together. So uh, some of the different componentry though, um, like when we first started, we had a very kind of generic card layout and we just had some very basic things. Um, and then we've got like a featured show, which is the next show. So this is going to be the next one here in four days and 16 hours and 44 minutes. We're actually going to have John ski on, which is awesome. Our good friend AJ is saying it's uh, it's not prod if you're if no one is watching. <laughs> That's a good point. Not everyone's on our website. So <laughs> um, but yeah, we're gonna have John Skeet. So we were just talking about him. So we're gonna have him on actually. Uh, and we've got ways for individuals to come and actually submit ideas. We have our upcoming shows. So if we click on this, you can see all of the future shows. Um, and we've got them all the dates and all the ideas there and, and we've opened it up and that's kind of why I think this thing took off a little bit, uh, the way it did is because, uh, we basically did a call to the developer community. We said, we want to highlight and celebrate this amazing, um, uh, diverse group of individuals and be really, really inclusive and pull them all in and let anyone have a voice and let us provide that platform for them to share the amazing stuff that they're doing. And that's what happened as soon as we opened it up. In fact, for a while now, we've already been booked through the entire year of 2020. Um, and we've got one, one show a week. We've been talking about actually doing um, two shows a week because it's so popular. Uh, but as I mentioned, anyone can go submit a show. So there's actually openings. Um, hey, Dave, on that last point, we'll have to ask for twice as much forgiveness. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, so maybe don't go submit an idea yet. We're still working through some of the logistics on some of this stuff. But uh, but know that if you have like even a general idea, um, right? So you could go here and submit an idea. And uh, I want to call attention to this little simple form. This is a very, very simple um, submit form here. Uh, and the submitting of an idea is basically letting you go to our website and saying, hey, uh, I have an idea. It could be for the show. It could be a feature of the website. And one of our good friends, uh, Alvin, who uh, does the Morning Dew, uh, he, he does this blog series. And he actually said, I would love it if you guys had an RRS, uh, RSS feed. Um, so the next morning, I wrote an RSS feed for him. And now they can go consume that, right? So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty neat to be able to collaborate in that sort of way. Um, so the one thing I wanted to call attention to is this is, a, like I said, a very simple form. Um, and as you can imagine, there's some pretty simple markup here. Uh, but we've got this little component here, the I'm not a robot. That's the Google's reCAPTCHA. So I'm going to minimize this. And we're actually going to kind of double click into some of the Instead of the boilerplate stuff, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. So I'm going to minimize this. We're going to go to the pages. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. So David, while you're um, searching for that, mm -hmm. um, we do have a question. And the question is, if you were to start this project all over again, um, would you write it in Blazor WebAssembly instead of Blazor Server? That's a really good question. So I'm gonna, let's just pivot real quick. So the answer is probably, uh, but not definitely. And the reason probably, but not definitely is because uh, about a month into it, we did pivot and we did introduce, um, oh, my computer is being very, very slow, come on. Uh, we did pivot and we did introduce the WebAssembly alternative and one of the downsides to it is uh, the way that we had architected our services uh, with the server side stuff. We had we, and this is probably a bad design or maybe an anti pattern, but it was the way that some of the templates were showing it. Is we actually had services that would wrap HTTP calls inside our pages, right? So if you were to do that with WebAssembly, you're exposing that service and those HTTP calls to the client. So then the, the correct way to actually architect that with WebAssembly is to have a controller. So then that's the, the stopping point, so to speak. So the controller would expose an API and then you have to get into authenticating and stuff like that. And then, you know, things get a little bit more 
uh, not necessarily complex because I mean, that's why it's nice to have the, the C sharp shared models where you can have uh, C sharp in the client, C sharp in the browser. So there, there's just uh, subtle differences with it. So let me show you this. So we actually had the WASM. This was back in June, on June 1st, we introduced it and it's still sitting there, the source code for it. Um, we just didn't take it much further uh, after that. But I mean, hopefully it answers the question. Yeah, the next part of that question, and I, I don't know if you plan to go into this at some point, is, mm -hmm. you know, what are the, the major differences between those two flavors of, of Blazor? Yeah, so the, 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 I think that's pretty much like where, um, the, those are the two di main differences, right, is when you have um, server side, you can think of the server side as being much like MVC, where, you know, the server hits something, or so let me try to illustrate the, the request response pipeline. So a request comes in from the client. If it's the initial request to the website, the entire website is then downloaded, the HTML, all the JavaScript, all the stuff that you need. And then the application starts up and starts doing its magic. Subsequent requests after that uh, rely on uh, the SignalR WebSocket connection or the, the connection that was established with SignalR. And then the deltas are kind of figured out and the DOM is updated. So that's the server side aspect to it. Um, and uh, so with with that, like if you have services, um, for example, let me see here, uh, this Smith and idea page is probably a great example. So we have uh, a logic app service that we uh, inject and uh, this is injected. And again, this is all gonna happen on the server side. So the, the request for this page comes up the server gets that request, it figures out what it needs to do. And since this page is part of the routing system for uh, Blazor, uh, it's just the deltas of SignalR that are gonna say, hey, here's this page, um, we're gonna render this bit of DOM and send it back to you. Um, and so it's, it's really just the deltas and the server handling all that stuff. So this service is completely uh, isolated to the server. Now, Alternatively, if we were to do this with WebAssembly, the way that this would actually occur is um, going back again to the request response pipeline, a request happens, the entire application is downloaded, and then this page, hypothetically, if it was written and architected the exact same way, this service and all the c -sharp code would be downloaded to the client and would execute on the client's uh, browser via WebAssembly. So then you could essentially, you know, look at that, decompile it and have all of my <laughs> source code. And I mean, this is open source anyways, but you could have it in the context of an execution, which means if you were to like, set breakpoints and whatnot, you would have access to certain variables and whatnot that uh, you shouldn't. <laughs> the one thing I would add to this uh, that I've personally run into with Blazor server, you know, while we're talking about the differences, um, the hosting story becomes a bit more complex with Blazor Server. And the reason for that is uh, with Blazor Server apps, there's an active SignalR connection that's maintained to the server. Um, so then when you go to deploy a Blazor Server app to a production environment, we actually recommend using our Azure SignalR service um, instance um, to scale that application in production. Again, because of the SignalR requirement. Right. Any other questions or? Nope. Um, all right, so this is the actual markup. So I'm gonna show you like the razor versus the, what we could probably refer to as if we put on our, our uh, web form tats, the, the code behind. So uh, they introduced several different flavors. So you could actually have like the razor and you could call out other. Uh, so this is like a, a directive that says this is a page for loading. And we're going to actually render the loading indicator, which is simply this markup, which is shared. And it's a grid with um, grid clouds and a grid logo. And this is actually live on the site. So what that means is if we go over to the the show and we say loading this is a like a kind of like an easter egg for us to show off so we're going to go to loading and the loading is actually our rocket buckle up we're taking off and this is our progress indicator and i wanted to test to see what it would look like so 
this is what it looks like. And it's just a route that sits there and anyone can navigate to it. So that's a little insider uh, Easter egg for you. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you that you can actually mix code within things like that. So we've got this little at code directive and within the context of our razor file, you can have C sharp. And this should be very, very familiar to you if you've done any MVC. It's using, again, the same actual uh, razor view engine that's existed for a long time. Um, uh, taking it up a notch though is basically separating those two things. So when we create um, a new razor component, in this case, a page, this is a route that says submit. So that's where the, the page will sit. We have an attribute here that says allow anonymous. And this is kind of cute, right? We can actually attribute this entire page uh, with this um, declaration. So that says that anyone that navigates to this page is allowed to go there. If we got rid of this, no one could go to the submit page. They'd be unauthorized. Um, and then we've got some simple markup. We've got a container class, uh, and this is the ideas, right? Our little bit of markup. And then we actually have an edit form. And the edit form is bound to this model, which is the show idea. And on valid submit, we've got this asynchronous context where we'll submit updates asynchronously. And that's just a little pointer to this C sharp function. Now, you might be wondering, where's that C sharp function at? Like if we scroll down, we don't actually see that in here, right? This is just markup and data binding. And that's kind of neat. Uh, so where is it at? So underneath, you can actually nest these and you can say public partial class. And the partial is very important because this razor, uh, the dot razor file for the submit idea page actually becomes a submit idea page class that razor will compile. So you need to say partial and the reason you say partial is so that you can ingest data into it. And these two things now become kind of one cohesive unit. And this is where you can keep your separate logic rather than having that at code directive. So then you get to use fancy attributes like inject, and you can say, we want a navigation. We want the logic app service. We're going to name it something more intelligible at this point. We're going to say show idea service, and we want a logger for our page. And another thing you might be asking yourself is what's this little fancy question mark here? Like if you're familiar with .NET and like the evolution of C Sharp, you know that there's been nullable types for a while, but this is actually a nullable reference type because it's an interface that's a reference type. Uh, and with C Sharp 8, the advent of that, we actually have the capability to specify within our project that we want to enable nullable. And then we can start annotating certain things as being nullable. So we're going to say that could be nullable. This could be nullable. This could be nullable. And it's kind of a safety net. Um, and, you know, since string is here, we're saying that string cannot be null since we're not annotating that as a question mark. So since it cannot be null and it's a parameter, we actually have to initialize it to null which is kind of odd. And the reason you do that is because the, the way that the warning system works for C-sharp 8 nullable annotations is that it evaluates that you're saying that this cannot be null, uh, but it's like it's unassigned. And since there's no assignment to it, it wants you to assign to it. And since we don't know what the value is going to be initially, uh, we're saying, damn it, it is null. <laughs> Right, that's actually called the damn it operator. Uh, <laughs> and so, go ahead. So, so, Dave, could you maybe explain to me a little bit about mm -hmm. um, uh, about the value prop of using the nullable reference types in in this context? Yeah. So, the I, I've been using them um, intentionally now uh, as much as possible. And at first, it's one of those things with like anything, any new language feature that you get a hold of, it's kind of like, oh that's ugly or that's weird or it's unnatural and you're unused to it and it doesn't feel familiar to you, right? Uh, but with this, it's one of those things where it's it's kind of like a safety net. So in .NET, if you've ever experienced, and raise your hand, uh, if you've ever experienced um, uh, object reference not set to an instance of an object, right? This has been deemed the billion dollar mistake by the inventor of null. He basically said that he should never have invented null because uh, it, it's kind of an un, you know, like an invalid state for you know things to be in. Um, 
it's kind of like truthy and falsy in JavaScript. That's a whole different subject. But uh, so the way that um, uh, C Sharp 8 lets you kind of annotate things, it, it puts on almost like safety rails. So now the IDE can reason about what your code is attempting to express it wants to do. So now when you annotate certain things, you're expressing your intent. So as a developer, you can say, uh, this could be null, right? And you can have like parameters or return types and you could say, so from an API standpoint, if you have a, a little function and the return type is string question mark, you're telling the consumer that this could be a string or it could be null, right? And the, the IDE will use that information, those annotations to kind of make sure that it's doing the right checks and balances, right? So it's basically a tooling enhancement capability. And actually I'm very excited to share that the, the .NET runtime team uh, for .NET 5 has annotated just over 80% of the entire .NET runtime the platform. Hmm. So, so, so th would it be correct to conclude then that that the that the compiled assemblies are basically the same as they'd be if you hadn't used the, the nullable reference types? Yes, yes. The one of the main differences is what happens is now anything that's consuming those APIs, you start getting warnings, like oh check your stuff, right? You didn't check your stuff over here, uh, right? So you don't have a check for this thing that's saying it could return null. So you might want to guard against it, right? Gotcha. Because during runtime or execution of that, it could be null. So, so yeah, that's one little uh, C-sharp eight tidbit, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, so then we've got some different properties here and these are just different things, uh, whether or not, um, well, actually, I want to show that real quick. I'm going to jump back over here and jumping around all over the place. But so we've got this edit form. We've got annotations that we're going to validate. We have our summary. We have got a way to submit. Um, but then a lot of this looks very, very uh, similar to what you'd expect to see in like a bootstrap form, right? You got your form groups, you've got your labels, you have inputs. And you'll notice that some of these things are a little bit more bold. And the reason they're uh, you know, bold in the IDE is because those are actual blazer bits. Those are different components that light up. So those are non-standard um, DOM or HTML tags, right? So div and label, these are standard input text area. That's actually a blazer component. And you'll get statement completion for these things, right? You can bind to various values. So since we have a show idea, it's just a simple POCO class that has uh, an idea string on it, a first name, a last name, and it binds to these fields that we saw in our submit form. Um, but the other interesting thing, and I'm gonna go back real quick here, is in our submit form, again, you notice that we saw that recaptcha. Oh, look at things broke, come on. Okay, we're, we're gonna have this recaptcha that loads up here. So you might be thinking to yourself, how did you get this Google reCAPTCHA JavaScript and all this stuff to render in the context of this server side little thing, right? And uh, enter true componentry of uh, Blazor. So if I scroll down, you're gonna see that we have this reCAPTCHA and this reCAPTCHA is actually a blazing reCAPTCHA object. And we say whether or not it's been evaluated. And this is an event handler, right? This is literally an event callback. So we can say, here's uh, unevaluated. This is our handler for that. So let's go take a look at where this is coming from. So we actually have a standalone project for this. And it's um, it's just basically a, uh, a Blazor component. And there's a bit of markup uh, in our markup here. It's very, very elaborate, super, super in depth millions of lines of code. It's just one line of code. <laughs> it's a div with an ID. And that ID is actually bound to uh, this ID that we're given here. So we've got this little blazer recaptcha. It's just a little a string that we're expressing. And we've got our JavaScript. Um, and this is an IJS runtime. And this is actually, it represents the instance of JavaScript, like the runtime uh, within the context of our component. So we're gonna inject that and hold on to it. And we're also gonna inject some reCAPTCHA options. 
And we're also going to inject an I HTTP client factory. And we're going to specify a parameter. And this parameter is an event callback. And it uh, returns a, a tuple, uh, which says is valid for a bool and a string array of errors. And that's called evaluated. So down here, we've got the on after render async. And we've got a little bit that says whether or not it's the first rendering. And if it's the first rendering, uh, we're going to walk up to our interop and say load async. And what that does is it basically allows us to run a bit of JavaScript. And let me actually pull up that JavaScript. So we've got a JavaScript. Um, we have a question, yeah. David. Um, before we move too much further, we should address this. So what's the timeline on getting AOT compilation on the WebAssembly flavor of Blazor? Uh, sounds like Steel Ninja would like to move away from Angular and React, uh, but can't justify it unless that startup. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I actually, I'm not too sure. I thought that there was a lot of talk about ahead of time compilation and actually uh, not only tree shaking, but formalized app trimming coming with .NET 5, which would be empowering all of those Blazor WebAssembly bits. And what that means is uh, app trimming is a very, very compelling aspect. And what app trimming does is, in addition to just simply trimming away various um, uh, assemblies that aren't being used, it actually starts taking those assemblies and um, deconstructing those and removing members that aren't even used. So you end up with kind of like little pseudo bits of, you know, it's a, a much smaller footprint. Uh, so I know that they're working a lot on that. And I know that ahead of time has been one of their biggest focuses. So I would say it's sometime in the near future, but I can't make promises. Um, I, I'd have to do a little bit more research, but that's a great question. I would also expect to see more improvements around that in .NET 6. Uh, so .NET 5 ships in November. Uh, we would expect .NET 6 to ship the following November. Uh, and then um, to expand upon what David was talking about with the tree shaking capabilities uh, or the assembly trimming, uh, we do have a doc that explains that. Um, it's also referred to as the assembly linker. I'll find a link to that and I'll paste it cool. in the chat. Cool. Link one, linker. One, one more thing real quick. So in regards to that, I would say just test it out now because even the way that it is currently out of the box, it loads pretty darn quickly. So even Absolutely. without the optimizations, I would definitely give that a try. Um, don't let that be the, the the stopping point. And then literally as they roll out a new version, you'll get those updated features. So Absolutely. I, definitely, I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't put put off working on it now. Absolutely. Yeah, I would I would definitely second what Lance said. Like um I have I'm a huge advocate for Angular. I I can't stand React. <laughs> um, but I know that Angular even ships and it's it's a pretty substantial initial hit for a spa, right? You're looking at two and a half, three megs. Uh, even with Webpack and kind of getting rid of some of that stuff. So, I mean, you're not too far off with, uh, you know, Blazor WebAssembly already. So, and that's before a lot of those major improvements come through. So take a chance, live on the edge. Uh, so back to this uh, JS interop. So this is just a class that sits here and it takes on the JavaScript runtime instance. And we can walk up to it and we can actually invoke various things. And what that does is that's basically serving as the proxy between C Sharp and JavaScript in the context of our component. So we say recaptcha.load. And this is invoke void async. That means that we don't return anything. So we just express that as a value task. And we've got other things here like render the recaptcha async. Given our instance, here's our element ID, a site key. And then we say render, and then this gets a little bit more elaborate, but there's a lot of really neat things going on here. So I wanna show you what this actually looks like in the component tree. Uh, so the JavaScript itself, we have a couple little um, JavaScript helper functions, and uh, we're gonna put those right on top of Windows. So we're gonna say window.recaptcha, uh, and the recaptcha object is equivalent to this object literal, which is uh, this load function, this render function, and this get response function. And those functions are described right up above. So we can walk up to recaptcha and say recaptcha.load, and that would evaluate to the invocation of this function. And it's async, right? You get all of that beautiful modern ES6 syntax here. So you say async function load, and we have an array. So from our script tag, 
we're going to walk up to all the scripts and we're going to basically ingest uh, the reCAPTCHA API JavaScript. And I will be completely honest with you, there is actually uh, a bit of code that is borrowed here from an open source project that I found that was doing something very, very similar to what we needed to do. And uh, they didn't quite componentize it. So we we took it to the next step and have it as a component here. And I've been considering um, putting it out as an actual package for people to consume. Uh, but basically what it does is just walks up to the document, appends the script to the head. And now we've got full on uh, reCAPTCHA Google API JavaScript fun to interact with. And we can uh, wait for the reCAPTCHA and we'll resolve it or set a timeout. And we also can render it. And this is where we actually take on the .NET object, the ID and the site key. And there's a few options that are kind of here, but um, so once we have the reCAPTCHA in context, that's the JavaScript that gets rendered down. Uh, we have our site key and our callback. And when the callback occurs, we're given this response and we actually walk up to our .NET object and we invoke back to that the response, which is unevaluated. So if you remember, we had that unevaluated function. So over here in our reCAPTCHA code, we have an uh, unevaluated method and we get this string reCAPTCHA response. And this we specify that this is callable from JavaScript in our C sharp here by saying JS invocable. So what that means is this is basically a round trip. So from our C sharp, we're calling into JavaScript and from our JavaScript, we're calling back into C sharp. Kind of neat, right? Yeah, I, I didn't even know that you could do that. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. It's crazy. So, so we call this, we get the response. This response is coming back from our reCAPTCHAs. Uh, this is actually from Google, right? Uh, so we can say uh, if our evaluated event callback that we have, if it has a delegate, in other words, if that event handler has uh, a registered uh, multicast delegate on it, we can take an action. So then this is where we'll say using our form, we're going to encode our secret key and our response. We're going to walk up to our client factory. We're going to create an HTTP client and we're going to post a response to the site verify and we're going to verify that the response is valid and if it's successful go ahead is there a question well so so let, let well we have that question in the audience but but let me jump in real quick so the you're getting the recaptcha the the inform whatever information is gathered from the client side javascript and you're passing mm -hmm. it back up through the signal r channel so that it'll get it, it can get posted to the the google url from the server side is that this that what's happening here yeah oh that's cool <laughs> yeah it's crazy right uh so yeah there's a question here if the javascript throws uh throws exceptions can it be caught in c sharp unfortunately no so if javascript throws up it throws up where it is same thing with c sharp so you have to isolate those two things um appropriately these, this is just serving as like the bridge between those two technologies. So again, you can use uh, the JavaScript, uh, the, the JS runtime to, to call into JavaScript from C Sharp. And likewise, once you created an object and you pass it into JavaScript, JavaScript can hold on to it. And then you can call back to uh, the, the, the server side stuff with that. So that's kind of how the bridge opens up. So yeah, this is, it's pretty elaborate actually how it works. And this is not a typical use case. This is just to show you one of the more advanced scenarios to where you can render the reCAPTCHA from Blazor itself and, and how that looks. So is this component um, the same for WASM, Blazor WASM versus ver uh, for end server? Or would they be they implemented, are implemented differently? differently? And uh, thank you for asking yeah. that. Yeah, they are, they are uh, implemented differently. And, and that's one of the things I had looked at too, is, you know, how would I implement this um, if I was to do that with WebAssembly? And there's there's slight tweaks to it. So a lot of the code um, is somewhat uh, what you'd expect, pretty similar, uh, but it's not too far off either. Uh, so then, yeah, you just basically okay. serialize the response there to verify that um, the reCAPTCHA, you know, is valid. And if it is, uh, we'll invoke the evaluated callback with that information. And if it's expired, we'll say, nope, it expired. So that's pretty much the entire bit of code there for that, with the exception of two little pieces. 
So there's a site key and a secret key, and these are from Google, and you'll have to specify those. Those are basically configuration options. And again, following some of that common nomenclature, uh, we've exposed a way uh, from the service collection extensions of this project to add Blazor reCAPTCHA given the configuration. So that's basically what you do is you pass it the configuration and assuming that your uh, key vault has registered these two things. Um, so a reCAPTCHA options with a site key of the Google site key that you took from Google and the secret key from Google, um, this will just work, right? We have a question from Jason. Jason, thank you for your continued support in the chat here. Um, good to see you here. David, have you found that you need less JavaScript with Blazor? Uh, absolutely. Yes, I, I have found that. Um, and I would say, I said this just recently on a show, only uh, only you can prevent JavaScript. So, <laughs> so take that very seriously. <laughs> so, um, you know, something else I'd point out here, uh, I think in the beginning when people started hearing about Blazor, they thought, well, this is intended to completely take out JavaScript. Um, when in fact, it's, it's not really meant to kill off JavaScript. You can, if you choose to, um, have a single page app written in Angular or React or you know your framework of choice and also sprinkle in Blazor components. And those two can just happily coexist. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to echo that, it's uh, that's one of the biggest misconceptions with Blazor and not even Blazor so much, but like even just WebAssembly proper everyone was fearful because I've given talks about WebAssembly. Everyone was fearful that, okay, WebAssembly is coming around. And what does that mean to JavaScript? Is that the end of JavaScript? And there was headlines. Oh my God, the end of JavaScript. It's definitely not. In fact, JavaScript and WebAssembly work very, very well together. And as we just demonstrated, uh, ironically, so does C Sharp and JavaScript. They play well together. There's this little happy medium to kind of have the two interact. Another great question here, David. Um, do you see Blazor server side as more of a replacement for web forms? I uh, I see it as definitely don't do uh, you know file new project web forms ever. Don't do that <laughs> uh, ever again, please. Um, uh, it's not so much a replacement for that. I think probably one of the natural progressions that most people had saw was uh, web forms MVC and then now Blazor server-side, I would say that it's it's probably a replacement for MVC, but that's just my opinion. Um, I don't know if, I mean, and, and actually even before, you know, MVC or after MVC, there was like Razor Pages. So uh, Blazor server-side is kind of a, the advent of that even. It's a continuation of, you know, the concept of pages and componentry and um, kind of breaking down some of those boundaries. So it's, it's a little bit different. So I would add, um, we actually, this is a great timely question. We actually recently published an ebook uh, focused on getting web forms developers over to Blazor server side. Um, I will post a link to that in the chat, but essentially the, the story is because web forms was never ported to ASP.NET Core, we couldn't just abandon those customers, right? We, we still value that customer base. We needed to provide them a way to in some way move to ASP.NET Core. And it turns out that there are parallels in the Blazor server world. Yep. Hey, Dave, can I ask a question real quick? Absolutely. <laughs> so all this, so I noticed you've got the, the your, the, what was the name of the Blazor package? Blazing something? Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the Blazing CAPTCHA, or I forget the name of the package. Yeah, yeah. It, would it be possible for you to package that up as like a NuGet package that anybody could just pull into their pull into yeah. their Blazor app? Yep, that's what I was saying before that I I wanted to get to that point to where we could do that, and I actually started looking at that for a while, just didn't have enough time to do it. Um, but absolutely, that's one of those things where uh, now that it's encapsulated like that, um, yeah. the only two things that you would actually need is the site key and the site. Uh, the secret key, those two things that you would already need anyways. And then you can ingest them and consume them just like this. This, cool. this line right here. So you'd add the package reference. You would configure those two things. You would call uh, the add uh, blazing recaptcha and pass in the configuration object that has those two variables. 
and away you go, and then you can consume it. So then you say recapture, evaluate it, and um, I'm gonna hold click and shift into that. So this is actually what is called uh, when recapture is validated. So if it's valid um, or errors, we've get this tuple instance and we'll invoke that asynchronously. And the way that, I mean, the reason that we have to do this um, is uh, if you don't call invoke, it doesn't execute in the correct um, synchronization context. So since this is happening disparately at some unknown amount of time, um, kind of outside of the, the server, uh, the signal our pipeline, so to speak, we need to make sure that this gets marshaled back to that to say, hey, this happened. And similar to like state has changed, but that's kind of going away now. So this is the new state has changed. This is you invoke asynchronously to say uh, we're doing something now that might impact how we're going to evaluate what our DOM looks like. Gotcha. You got some. You got some homework to do, man. So I want a client-side version NuGet package of this too. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And then what we can say is we set this bit is recapture valid, and if it's valid, um, we actually have bound that property is recapture valid to our DOM. So let's go look at that one more time, and we'll say graph is recapture. Come on, look. Nope, I'm not. It's not typing. It's not typing. Um, ba, 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 ba. There's a button here, disabled. The submit button is disabled if the form is invalid or recaptcha. I should probably invert that and say is invalid or something, but you get it, right? Not valid. Uh, and then that's the way it works. And this is one simple form, uh, but there's many, many forms. Again, this is like the evolution of a huge growing project. Um, but yeah, let's see what else we can look at. Uh, so once the idea is submitted, um, now we've got this submit update and we have the edit context. And now this is where things get interesting. So we're gonna say we've got this show idea service. And if it's not null, again, this is annotated as being potentially null because it comes from dependency injection. And if I'm a bad developer and I forgot to add that as a service, do I want my app blowing up? Or would I rather check for it and just not? I mean, this is again a debate you can have with yourself or your team. Um, so I just chose not to blow up the world and I'll just check to see if it's null. And if it's not, we can actually walk up to it and use it. And we're gonna say propose show idea, given the idea and the first name and last name, those are both optional. So we can coalesce over to saying that that's omitted and excluded. Uh, and then the email or the Twitter handle that's non-existent. But all we really care about is whether or not uh, the person's giving us an idea and that they have an email address. And let's go to the implementation of this. The implementation is pretty straightforward as well. This is, this is where things get kind of cool now. So we're actually into a different project. So we left the context of our web and we have isolated services now. So this is our service tier. And, and here, you can have any standard service functionality that you want. So I have a, a proposed show idea that takes these parameters. I see a question here. Is it possible to introduce Blazor into an existing MVC application? Um, Scott, do you know? Um, I have not tried it. Thank you for the question, Jason. Again, I have not tried it with MVC. I have done it with Razor Pages. So if it's possible with Razor Pages, I assume it's also possible with MVC. And I say that because Razor Pages is built on top of MVC. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think yes. Uh, I guess I guess the, the answer I, I would provide would be yes, it is possible. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so yeah, we've got this service here and then we're going to post JSON async and I just have a little helper function that's pretty generic and what it allows me to do is pass in an object and uh, URL and we're going to serialize the object and we're going to have some string content that we're using and I want to call another uh, C-sharp 8 feature out right here and this is the using uh, declarations which are basically allowing us to do this with the omission of the extra parentheses and the extra squiggly brackets uh, explicitly stating our scope. Uh, now the scope for content is inferred based on its usage. So it's basically the same thing as wrapping this up. But now instead of having this deep nesting of um, code flow, you can actually just look and it's more lined up 
vertically this way. So it's kind of nice. So we've got our client, we post our content and we ensure that everything's happy. And you might be asking, well, where is this actually going to? This is kind of a weird place. So we actually have our settings that are coming in and we have a post show idea URL. So there's this URL for logic apps and logic apps are amazing. Uh, Cam actually introduced me to them. I had never used them before and I'm going to pull open my portal. Uh, but Cam, do you want to say a few words about logic apps? Because uh, I think they're a pretty amazing innovation and uh, they're really super duper lightweight. So the, the, the whole, the whole idea behind logic apps is kind of building block programming. Like if you ever do, like I, if you've ever done like day of code with your, what is it, hour of code with your kids or volunteered at your kid's school to, 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 to do that or whatever. Um, it's a lot like the language that's used for that, like scratch. If you've ever played with scratch from MIT, the kind of this educational uh, programming language, logic apps reminds me of that. You've got these building blocks from different web services. And the idea is that you're just piecing them together and getting piece of data A over to service B and, and different endpoints. And we'll, we'll see here in just a second what, what it looks like, but it's it's really useful. It's like, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with if this, then that, if, mm -hmm. it's like if on steroids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good way to put it. Uh, so you basically walk up to your Azure instance or your Azure portal and you do a new resource like you would for anything else. And you say logic app and you get into basically creating a logic app and logic app has this little designer. The designer is, I think, pretty intuitive because the first time I used it, I was able to figure it out without doing any reading whatsoever. And it's, I think, ironic that I don't like reading docs because <laughs> I write docs all the time. <laughs> so I, I choose not to read them. I, I choose to fail and learn that way. But anyways, uh, so basically you can specify what the trigger is going to be for one of these. And I say when an HTTP request is received. Let me see if I can bump this up a little bit. Bump, bump, bump. Come on. Zoom. No? Yeah. Um, that's not working, is it? So when an HTTP request is received, there's a there's a zoom thing in the upper right of the. It wasn't. It's not actually zooming in though. It doesn't do anything. Yeah, it's garbage. Oh wait. Do you have, oh. Do you have Zoom it installed on your machine? I do not. It's working, but it's not actually updating that percentage. That's weird. Anyways, uh, so one thing to call out is you get this. Um, uh, you get this HTTP post URL, and this is the URL to uh to my endpoint that we were just posting to from settings and again those settings are coming from key vault when it, our app spins up it pulls those down and then we have those configured in key vault and this url is essentially sitting there and, so this and Go and I'll just go, go ahead and chime in on this a little bit. That URL has has an OAuth token in it, and and you know, Dave, don't show the rest of it for God's sake. But um, <laughs> but uh, the the uh, the authentication is all handled by the OAuth token embedded in the URL. Mm -hmm. And then you actually get to specify the JSON uh, schema, and you can say what your objects are going to look like. So now, in the context of this trigger, this logic app, it has full understanding of what it you're passing it. And assuming that you actually pass to it the object that you're promising you're going to, you can take additional actions. And in this case, I say, I want to send an email, right? So when you go to our website and you submit an idea, we'll email all of the stuff that you give us and we'll end up getting an email on our site. Uh, in our, we have a shared inbox, the .NET Docs show at Microsoft and Cam, Scott and I will get it. And the same is true for any other logic app uh, functionality. So it's a trigger comes, right? That's basically this endpoint and the sending of the email with all the content from it. And so we specify these with um, like the, the idea. Again, this is mapped from the object, the JSON schema that was given to us from the, the trigger above. And it's very, very straightforward. It, it took literally five minutes to basically set up an automated email system. Uh, with logic apps, it's insane. Well, and, and let's 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 boil that down just a little bit. It's what you've done is you've created a RESTful endpoint that you that that you have a you have a schema that you can submit that you can post an object to, and mm -hmm. that uh, that you get a formatted email sent to you know wherever. You know, that's that that's an afternoon's worth of work in Web API, but it's 
And right, and then you have to have service and authentication. You have to have an SM on TP uh, client available. You have to handle retries. You have to do all. Yeah. So there's a ton of stuff that just happens for you. And that was, I was thinking to myself, oh man, you know, they're asking for automated emails and how are we going to do this? And I was literally thinking SMTP server or like the client um, bits that come from .NET. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll have to code that up as another service. And what's that going to look like? And where should we log to if it fails? And what credentials are we going to have to in log in uh, and put inside there for the, um, the key vault? And yeah, it's literally just a URL now and call it. <laughs> So that's, it's really, that's pretty awesome. Is there a .NET doc show going more into detail on this? <laughs> uh, no, this is it. This is your special edition right oh, there now. There you go. Love it. <laughs> uh, so we actually have several different logic apps. Um, we've got one for calendar updates and calendar invites. The initial calendar uh, is created. Uh, so when people submit a show and if we accept that show and we put it into the roster or our schedule, we'll send them uh, a calendar invite and they'll have all the information in there. And once we get closer to the show actually happening, we'll update it. And that's all programmatically from the website. So once you go to the website, we actually have an admin page that uh, is only allowing uh, cool Microsoft employees in. So, Which is uh, so by, by cool, we mean uh, David and Cam. Uh, I'm not allowed in. Too many yeah. Scots. It, it actually <laughs> threw a Scott overflow exception. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's he, he's joking, but for for some reason that we have yet to determine, it won't let his Azure Active Directory uh, credentials. It doesn't like them. It won't let him in. So he's, he's not a loner machine. That's why. There's other things. There's other things. Oh man. Um, so yeah. So now I have the admin. Uh, I've logged in. So now I can sign out if I want. But I have uh, a few additional things that are sitting here, and one of those things is um, our our shows but the show's in the context of like editing them. So, oh, it looks like we've got, oh, hi, Andy. Uh, I'll admit that I'm not directly in C-sharp uh, or not working directly in C-sharp is odd for me. Uh, but every time I see logic apps, I want to know more and I feel like I should use them. Yeah, you probably should use them. Um, I have felt the same way. I uh, I had never used them before and I just started using them probably a, a few months ago when cam introduced them to me and i'm not looking back they're amazing they're super simple I, I guess let me go back here and i'll show another selling point real quick so uh when you send the email you can actually get a response if you want from that like you can get additional context out of it but you get all of like the the overview of successful calls to it and like basically like the telemetry on this stuff and like you can click into it like if any of these like look the first one failed well why did it fail you can click into it and actually see the payload at that point in time and determine what was wrong with it was it malformed uh, when did this happen uh, who was the client that was requesting it it's just it's super cool i don't know i love it they, didn't we didn't we have some occasion to do some kind of neat round trip thing where we had to we had to go find an existing something on your calendar and update it yeah yeah that's what i was talking about before how we added like we have uh the calendar one that creates the calendar and then we've got the one that does the update and we had written this logic initially and this is a great segue to actually talk about Cosmos DB. That's our, our data store here. Uh, so, uh, but, so basically our Cosmos DB um, POCO, the, the class that was presenting our documents for our shows, didn't have the field for the calendar invite ID. So we added the field afterwards. And since it's there's no schema, it doesn't matter. It's totally fine. We could do that. We're not gonna break anyone's existing code. We're just adding a field that is empty, right? So what we can do then is create our uh, Blazor uh, site to update and add a field for it. So then now we can go edit it. And now we have basically built like a huge content management system. Uh, and we got made fun of for doing it, but it's been a lot of fun. Uh, let me see real quick here. So let's Matt, John Skeet, let's go to John Skeet's show and pick on him a little bit. They said we were insane and, and they would be right. <laughs> So this is kind of how we manage it. Like when we'll get requests, they'll show up here in shows as an admin. We can look at them. We can see what we'll obviously get the email. Uh, and then we can go in here. We can mark whether or not they're published. And once they're published, boom, they're live on the site. And then uh, once they're published, they'll get a calendar invite. Notice how John's show, he doesn't actually have a calendar invite ID. 
Like that field is there. It exists now. We can actually edit it and save it and put it in there. And he actually has a calendar invite ID. It's just that we didn't save it before because our POCO didn't have that property on it until afterwards. We updated the code, so to speak. So now we can go back in there and do a retro kind of fix it. But it's easy to kind of evolve these things as time goes on. Uh, so I'm going to showcase that real quick. So we looked at logic apps a little bit, and that's kind of sweet. But let's look at our actual uh, schedule service. So the schedule service is some very, very elaborate code again. <laughs> this is the decorator pattern. So if you're unfamiliar with that, it's basically just saying uh, one to one expressing your intent. So we've got an I schedule service and the implementation of schedule service uh, requires a, an I repository of docs show. And you might be saying like, oh, what's this I repository thing? Uh, we're going to, we're going to get into that in just a second, but that's, that's one of the exciting things I'm, I'm excited to share. Uh, but we have these very, very simple create, read and update and delete functionality. So crud. Uh, so we can create a show, given a show, we can delete a show, given its ID, we can get, uh, a show by its ID. Uh, we can get all shows, um, since a date time, or, or we can update a, a show. And those are simply expressed to the repository. Very, very simple. So now if we go look at the repository itself, the repository is uh, kind of the same thing here. It takes a generic T where T is a document. And the document is another very, very elaborate thing. Of course, that's my sarcasm. This is very, very simple. It's an ID that is initially assigned to a new GUID as a string. And it's a JSON property of ID, it's lowercase. And we have this internal logic that says, hey, that's the partition key. So the partition key is, uh, think of it as a way to kind of partition um, how things are persisted within the context of Cosmos database. Uh, so it, it, would that be comparable to say tables in a relational database? Uh, sort of, yeah. So um, yes and no, it, it's kind of like saying that this is one of its main identifiers and this will be the thing that's guaranteed to be unique about all of them. Mm. So we've got this document. So anything that, uh, whoops, where'd we go? Anything that is, come on, anything that is uh, an implementation or sorry, a subclass of document, any T um, has this functionality, right? The, the create, read, update, and delete stuff. And this repository um, project here has a default repository implementation. And this is actually essentially a wrapper around some of what I believed to be a complex SDK for Cosmos database. So the Cosmos database, uh, the .NET client is a bit uh, kind of hard to swallow. Like there's a lot that's kind of going on. Like you have this notion of um, containers and you have this notion of databases and how do they relate to one another? And no, we're not talking about Docker and uh, you know, you have to worry about whether or not uh, it's been created or not. And do you need to have both a container or a database? And it, right, it gets pretty confusing. And some of the API uh, is is kind of hard to look at. Like if you're unfamiliar with partition keys, well, I think you shouldn't have to worry about them. You shouldn't even need to think about them. So uh, I, I abstract all of that away for you in this con little convenience repository. Um, and you end up with a way to, to get a container and read items from it and return what is referred to as the resource. That's the document. Um, but it's it's just our JSON object, right? So uh, the same thing here. We can get a container, and then we're going to actually get um, a value task of I enumerable. And we have an iterator, and we can iterate over this. And this is prior to the I async enumerable. And I'd like to add that to the API. but. Uh, you're going to have an expression on a predicate where you say you're going to get various um, iterations of, you know, things that match that predicate. And, you know, we've got try catch logic around all of it, um, a way to create, but all of this stuff right here, I mean, all of this complexity is just abstracted away. So what the beauty, like the beauty of this is we add, uh, so when you take on this package and you say add Cosmos DB repository, you expose an I repository of T, but the generic type as singletons. So they're a one-to-one -one mapping. So anytime, anywhere within our application, when I say I want dependency injection to provide to my class, 
an I repository of whatever the thing is that I want to um, have a data store for, it's going to give me the corresponding implementation of it. And that is the instance of the default repository. So it's a generic way to express uh, a very, very elaborate uh, kind of wrapper that simplifies Cosmos DB dramatically. So then you get stuff like this to where we're able to persist objects with ease. I mean, this is really, really simple. Like, I, I think this is a huge improvement to what the .NET SDK does for Cosmos DB right now. Hey, David. Um, mm -hmm. So we so you've talked a bit about how complex that SDK is, but maybe we should take a step back from even that and answer the question, why Cosmos over something like SQL Server? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good question. So one of the decisions for me was the fact that I didn't know what our shows were going to be shaped like. And I didn't want to have to worry about like, for example, if you go with like a relational database, you end up with this notion of like very tight coupling. Like, you know, you end up having like primary keys and foreign keys and with relational databases, like how does that model, like the mental model look like if we have a show, do we have to have people who are guests and then, uh, you know, all these different little aspects and how do we want to relate that? And how do we want to architect the relations between those things? And it becomes very cumbersome and it becomes like kind of something that's difficult to, um, it's very taxing. And again, that's my opinion. Um, so what I would rather do is not have to worry about that at all. I'd rather just like to say, this is the shape I want to work with in C sharp. And if I can persist it and read it back at a later point in time, I don't care, right? You figure it out for me. And that's kind of what NoSQL does. Like this document database structure here, it, it allows us to literally just take any object and as long as it can serialize and deserialize from JSON to our C sharp object, doesn't matter. Um, so we actually have some models here and I'll show you what our docs show looks like. Uh, it is a subclass of document. So we already get an ID for it. So anytime I instantiate a doc show, it's going to have a brand new ID, which is again from that good. Uh, we've got a date. We have some bits, whether or not it's a placeholder, uh, whether or not it's scheduled, whether or not it's in the future, whether or not it's new, if it's been published or not, um, whether or not a calendar invite's been sent, right? All this little bit kind of state about our show, the guest stream URL, and then we have an I enumerable of person, but we call these ones guests and we call these ones hosts and then we have tags and titles and you can see it like there's quite a bit of little i mean it's it's not super elaborate but it's enough to where there's like this kind of organic hierarchy of things and this has evolved dramatically this is probably when one of the most dynamic objects of the show itself of the content of the thing that we've kind of built out so during the creation of the website this has been one of the most commonly changing things because we didn't really know all the things that we were going to care about. And that's the point of it. It's almost agile in that you don't have to know. It can evolve. We can drop properties. We can add properties. And the way that Cosmos works is uh, if you add a property, um, if you add a property, what happens is uh, and it, there was an object already in Cosmos that um, existed but didn't have that property when that pro when that uh, object is read back out of cosmos it's hydrated without that property being set not a big deal right that's how we can add to our form a way to edit that field done no problem at all um the other situation is if we remove something right that might have potentially broken a relational database situation right if you start removing things or changing things or altering the structure of things uh, in this scenario with um, Cosmos DB, it simply doesn't, right? It just adapts to it because it's just you read it out and then you put it back in and then away you go. Just serialization and, and deserialization is, is the only the, the only part that could break, really. Exactly. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there's, I mean, there's other parts here that we could show off. I'm trying to think what's what's cool to look at. Um, ba, 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 ba. Are there any other questions? Has anyone else chimed in with something? Nothing yet. For the folks in the chat, if there is something you're curious about, uh, feel free to ask. I'm going to try to see if I can't find something really neat. And it doesn't, it, I was I will, just going to say, it doesn't uh, necessarily have to be a question about about the uh, about the website. If you have any questions 
um, you know, even tangentially related. It's a, you know, we're here. <laughs> yep. And I was going to say, I'll put up the banner again, but, you know, if any of this code that you've seen so far piques your interest, um, the website itself is open source on GitHub. And mm -hmm. You'll find the link right there in the banner. Yep. So, so real quick, can you show us where you call the logic apps from within this Blazor app. Did we show? Did you show that? Yeah, before? yeah. That's so. That's actually from, for example, like the submit idea page. So. Okay, got yeah. it. So, so for like when you send out the emails, um, would that be called any differently? You're just going to be calling the URL basically. Right. Logic here. So I'll show you. Um, this is a live demo from mad.net so, right and then we'll even throw in a little bit of fun stuff here okay there we go i love it we'll just put that in there david pine six of course notice how the send button is not enabled but if i hit my nice. recaptcha I'm going to kind of talk through. So I click this and this is going to execute that JavaScript that we were looking at from our blazer component. So the click event, I'm going to, this is going to blow your mind. All right. So I click on this and what happens is the HTML registers that that click occurred. It calls into our recapture logic and the callback is then invoked and it has an instance right now of our .NET object and it calls back into our server code over the pipeline and says, hey, evaluate that this response is valid. And so it walks up to that site verify from Google and it says, here's the response from this user's interaction when they clicked, I'm not a robot. And if it's valid, it will then come back here and say, yes, you're valid. And then it will I'll enable this button. So all of that has to happen. Click. Am I a robot? I might be a robot. I'm not a robot. Ta-da. So I can hit send and it's going to say, awesome. You're amazing because it's Lance. Um, and then I should have an email. I'm going to pull this up real quick. This just came through right now. Whoops. I'm going to pull it up on the screen. Give me one second. Double click. Come on. And Dave, just to Lance's point, could, could you show us the the uh, the HTTP client code again, real quick? Yes, yeah. let me do that real quick. Uh, ba, 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 ba. This right here, or the actual implementation of this? Uh, yeah, it was the actual impl implementation. Okay. Because there was, I remember somewhere in there you were you were getting an HTTP client and, and doing the post. Ah, uh, yeah. So in. Um, in this object up here, we inject an HTTP client, and uh, it's it's the shared client because we have three different logic app instances that we, we've set up. We've set the one for submitting ideas. We've got one for uh, creating a calendar invite for a show. And then we've got the follow-up, which will update a calendar invite from a given show. So all of those exist within here. So we've got the create. We've got the update for the calendar invites, and then we have a request show, uh, or sorry, no, uh, proposed show. So proposed show idea. So we've got an idea, first name, last name, email, Twitter handle, and then that's expressed as this post JSON async with a new anonymous object. The anonymous object has an idea, a first name, last name, email, and Twitter handle. I mean, that's the arguments right there, but just as an anonymous object. So we kind of package it all together. And then we have our settings and the settings are, uh, that's the post show idea URL. That's the encrypted uh, with the token in it, that, that URL from logic app itself. Um, and then the post is basically this little helper function that's shared, which is async value task bool, post JSON async given T, which is whatever object we want to serialize to. And we're going to say uh, our URL. And you'll notice that that object up here, this anonymous object, was actually the contract. That's the JSON schema that we put into our logic app. So we've got our URL, and we post it to the client. And then if it's successful, we're done. It's as simple as that. And one, one neat thing about the logic app uh, when you set up that schema is you don't actually have to do it in the, the format that, that they define schema in. You can, uh, you can just give it an example, and it'll infer schema. Yep. 
Um, and then, da, 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 da. yes. So real quick, when the logic apps and the authentication aspect, uh, you say it's a static, basically token that's basically embedded into the URL. Is that the best way to go about doing that? Is that a long-term secure thing as opposed to like signing into, is there, is there any other, other type of authentication for the logic app, like, like signing in, getting a bearer token back and then passing that token along in the HTTP header? You know, or, it's, it's a great or, question. I don't have an answer for you because I've always I've right. always just done the, the OAuth token in the URL. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know. If, you think it's good, if it's good enough for Cam, it's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, store that URL secretly. But, I, but I, you know, when the, when the HTTP request gets formulated by whatever client, the the you know everything after the uh, everything after the question mark is, is sent over the encrypted channel. So, got it. Okay. So I did want to show off another thing here real quick. So Cosmos DB, and I will admit this, a lot of people actually say that they think it's expensive. Um, and I I don't know. I don't have to pay for it because I work for Microsoft. So <laughs> it's not like I have to worry about it. But other people do, and that's a valid concern. Um, so uh, the way that we architected this was to actually be kind of cash heavy. And the way we did it was we actually implemented an, uh, a hosted service. So within the context of our ASP.NET Core application, we can have, so it's in process, right? In process with our application, side by side, we have a background service running. So, and that lives outside the context of the request response pipeline. But it's nice because since it's in process, we can actually share uh, a caching mechanism. So certain request response light, uh, re request response uh, pipeline things that need um, the, the, the documents or like the shows, for example, they can rely on cached instances of those. And we'll use this service worker or the schedule worker rather to periodically cache those. So we've got a sliding uh, full cycle uh, delay and absolute expiration. We have our memory cache, which is uh, iMemory cache. And it's just basically uh, comes from the Microsoft extensions. And you can say add uh, memory cache and you get that. There's a different way to do like a distributed um, caching if you want as well. We didn't need that because we only got it on the one server. And then uh, so we have our uh, um, uh, the other thing to call out is this inherits from background service. So then we can override the execute async. And this is basically the stopping token. So when the application is ending, uh, we can hold on to that token and, and evaluate not, not, uh, whether or not it's been canceled. And if it has been canceled, uh, we'll you know gracefully shut down. Um, but what we do here is we periodically will check to see whether or not we want to update um, our cache and our cache will just be like the source of truth for our shows. And whenever we need our shows, like for example, in the index page, we have, uh, I'll show you what that looks like. So our index page uh, loads up uh, rather than asking for the schedule stuff raw, it's asking for the memory cache, but we also have a couple other things here. Uh, we're doing stuff with feature flags and I mean, it's, there's, we could probably go on and on talking about all the stuff here, but uh, when the thing is initialized, uh, we're going to, do I even use the cache? What am I doing? Oh yeah. Oof. Don't even know my own code. Uh, so we walk up to the cache and we have this uh, static class uh, that basically holds on to our keys and we call it cache keys conveniently. So our show schedule, that's the key for it. And basically we say get or create async. So if uh, it's already there, great, we're gonna use that one. Uh, otherwise, if this is the first request in, we're going to say that's evaluated as the schedule service, uh, getting all of the shows uh, from this far away, right? Since that date. And uh, if it's the first time in, um, that hit will incur and then all the shows will be there and we'll do some logic and make sure we display them correctly in our grid of cards. Um, usually um, this, go ahead. David, I, I was going to say, um, I, I'm not sure if you pointed this out already, but um, there's some weird syntax there that folks may not have seen before, the exclamation point period. Mm. Um, can you just explain what that is? Yeah, that's so that's actually going back to the dammit operator I talked about a while ago. So since this is defined as uh, being null. So, right, look at the IDE actually lights up here and it says, whoa, whoa, whoa. It says schedule service may be null here, like, because I didn't guard against it. And because of that, 
um, I would have to either wrap this in a if service schedule uh, is not null um, evaluation or right or expression, or I can simply say at this point in time, I trust myself in the code in the dependency injection framework enough to say that, damn it, that thing is not null, right? And uh, it hasn't blown up yet, so that's that's good. I probably I probably could safely change this um, to not right to say that this isn't going to be null, uh, but then it would want me to do this sort of stuff where it says, darn it, it is null right now because it, it, dependency injection hasn't occurred yet, <laughs> right? So then you end up with kind of a give and take, like how do you want to annotate it? Um, and that's that's kind of a good question, I guess. I, I haven't decided. I mean, you can do it either or. Um, uh, if you decide to do it this way, um, you have to kind of express with a bang outside there. Otherwise, it's going to want you to check. Uh, but it's probably pretty safe to say that. Uh, <laughs> Jason says, that's crazy talk, knowing David. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it depends. I mean, I, it depends on how you want to annotate it, but that's a good question. <laughs> um, what else we got here? So there's any questions? Can you do? Um, yeah, go so ahead. Uh, is it worth talking about uh, Nota time? So uh, we're using Nota time in the, the project. Um, that's probably been one of the biggest pain points for us. Uh, actually, <laughs> next week we have John Skeet coming on to school us in Nota time and uh, do a live code review and show us how we're using it wrong. Yeah, uh, there's well, been... Well, there's been... That, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Dave. Did we ever fix the, the problem where the... Gosh, what was it? Something the website was doing really weird that it was trying to show our video stream when like three hours off from when we were actually doing it? <laughs> Uh, all right, start with, start with what is yeah, Nota Time. Yeah, all right. So Nota Time is an open source project that uh, John Skeet has been a, it's been a passion project of his for many, many years. And uh, so it basically, uh, John Skeet's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder when it comes to date time um, and the way that different programming languages will represent date time. Uh, and uh, very, very valid. Uh, very, very valid reasons. Um, there's a lot of things that are kind of frightening about how uh, things have worked or not worked. And uh, date times have been a huge, huge um, pain in the ass for lots, lots of people, M myself included. Uh, if if you want to see some very colorful language, look at the commit history in the comments. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not great. It's, uh, it's a profanity filter moment. Um, so yeah, he's got this beautiful package and uh, I was trying to use his API, which is supposed to be better. And uh, I have not uh, been super successful at it. So we're very, very thrilled. I've been intentionally kind of letting some of these date time bugs stockpile, knowing that he's gonna be on the show. And the idea for the show is to actually, and we're doing it next week, Monday, by the way. Uh, so we know it's Labor Day, but we're gonna, we're gonna take one for the team. Uh, 11 a.m. next week, Monday, we're going to have John Skeet on and we're going to have him in this code base, right? The number one contributor to Stack Overflow is going to rip apart my C sharp and you're going to call it terrible, uh, but in a much better accent than I have. And, and, and uh, yeah, that goes without saying. But the, <laughs> the um, just so we're clear, we're telling everybody, hey, tune in Monday at 11 a.m. Central. Um, this is not the channel that you, not, this is not the Twitch channel you'll tune into. This is this is our original Twitch channel when we were an unofficial thing, and now we're like officially a Microsoft thing. So now we get to use the official Microsoft channels, and this one sits over here and we use it for special occasions like this. Exactly. Yeah. I'm in the link and I'll make sure I send it out to everybody who was part of this. Awesome. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, we've got this date time service, which has uh, been a place where I've been trying to encapsulate a lot of the logic, but it is, it is nightmarish. It is crazy. It is insane. Doing anything with date times is, uh, oh, it is, is a lot of fun. I mean, I, I've written some really crazy stuff too, like this interleave with adapter, which is an extension method, which walks up to enumerables and lets you pass in all this crazy stuff. <laughs> I'm, this is where I started getting embarrassed about my code now. It's like, I don't want you to see this. Why did you have to bring it up? <laughs> um, 
I do have a question unrelated to Nota Time, but I want to make sure we get to it, and then we'll switch back to Nota Time. Can you debug your client side Blazor? Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I can set breakpoints, and um, in the C sharp uh, on pages, for example, those breakpoints will hit. In fact, you can actually set breakpoints in the JavaScript as well. You can have them in the JavaScript and in the C sharp, and you can go from one to the other, and it's it's a really crazy experience. But that full experience end to end like that is only possible with Visual Studio proper. If you're to do this with Visual Studio code, you don't get to set breakpoints throughout the entire thing like that. I think you can just do. Uh, I actually haven't even done it, so I don't. I don't. I don't think you can do it fully on like that. But, um, but yes, the answer is yes. Um, so yeah, we're not going to look at this. We're going to save this for Monday's show. I will show you this cool little thing though. Um, uh, so C sharp introduced ranges and this is clever little, uh, end inclusive or end exclusive, uh, way to express, uh, a numeric range. So we've got 20 dot dot 31. So that means actually, oh God, that's right. It's end exclusive, but I should, this should be a two, but anyways, we can say is in range. And this is actually an extension function that I wrote, uh, that walks up to range and says, uh, and extends it, right? It says, given this value, uh, is it within there, uh, is the value within the range, right? Is the value greater than or equal to the start value and the value is less than or equal to the end value. And it's a pretty neat little extension function on top of range. So then you can say, here's this range, 20 to 31, is that day within that range? <laughs> It's a pretty neat little thing. I don't know. I'm proud of stuff like that, so don't make fun of me. <laughs> Not uh, any more than usual, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> I do lots of little clever things like that. Well, I call them clever. They're not clever. They're probably a pain in the butt. But you can unit test them, and that's all that matters. Um, what else do we got? I don't know how much time. I mean, it's 730. Uh, should we go longer? I can probably show some more. Otherwise, we can open it up uh, for a form of questions. We we always block out two hours, so you feel free to go as long as you want for as long as it's not longer than another 29 minutes. Okay. <laughs> there was, um, so the, I believe it was the first day uh, we were streaming. Uh, it was like right after the website had gone live. Mm -hmm. The website went down immediately when we started streaming. Yes. Uh, we blame that on Dave to this day. It did, yeah, uh, yeah. What, what actually happened there? What were some lessons learned? Oh my God. All right. So here, the lesson learns are date time bugs. Uh, so we've got this countdown feature because we think we're clever. So if you've noticed um, here in the, the homepage, the featured show, we've got this logic. That's what that interleave with adapter was, by the way, it was walking up to all of the shows and it's basically doing this um, enumeration over them. It's iterating over them and it's determining which ones are where and when they're going to occur relative to the current time. And it's saying anything that's in the past, we're going to put on the bottom part of the page. Anything that's in the future that is not the next show is uh, expandable here with the upcoming show drop down little thing. Um, and then the next show is what we call the featured show. That's the, the next show that we're going to showcase. And the next show that we're going to showcase basically has this little component, this countdown timer. And this countdown timer has been the bane of my existence for the last couple months um, because of date time bugs. And uh, there's, there's a sweet spot in some of the windows and some of the logic. And we've actually had uh, open source contributors come and try to fix certain things here with date time bugs uh, in the app. And we we accept those and are you know willing to, to look at those. One of the things that actually happened was uh, our good friend here, Isaac, uh, Isaac Levin did a pull request to, he wanted to show like the, the schedules, um, the show schedules in your local time. And I explained to him that we're using Blazor server. So that means it would only be the server's local time, not the client's local time, but with WebAssembly, it would be the client's local time, right? So that's one of the disparities too. Like one of the things to kind of visualize the mental model of how the hosting is different. Uh, so we've got this countdown timer here in this featured show. And as we count down, uh, we actually get pretty excited and we'll show some little animations. Like there's like a, a countdown. I think it's 90 seconds out. The thing starts flashing. You got like this little pulsing CSS, real, real simple stuff, right? When we're 30 seconds out, it does something else. And then uh, I think we actually embed uh, the the Twitch frame, and 
then once the show comes in, you'll actually see like the live show coming into it. And it's actually, it's a pretty neat little feature, right? To kind of say, here's the countdown. Here's what the show looks like if we're days away, but within, you know, a couple minutes out, we're flashing and then boom, our website actually turns into a viewer for our live show and we embed it in there. Uh, but that function is all based on this one countdown um, component and the countdown component is pretty simple. So we have some markup. Well, the markup is simple. The other stuff's not. And I'd love for anyone here who's better at programming, probably everyone on the show, uh, to to come do a pull request to help me clean this up. But as I remember the the occasion Scott's talking about, when that it was that that Twitch embed when it opened up, is when the site just crashed. <laughs> and if you notice, I put up the the Twitter banner. This this is a nice segue into the next. Uh, disaster of the story but i'll let you finish this one <laughs> that's right yeah that's a good story uh all right so we've got this div and we have a shadow and a background and you know we got our our little countdown that's like our our paragraph there and we've got another div and we have some spans and these are literally just the time remaining which is a, di a time span on our component so we've got our days hours minutes and seconds and we just do string or interpolation formatting those with double digits we actually have this, this is um, another little Easter egg. If you're gonna do, uh, if you're gonna look at our website, you can actually right click on the DOM by the, the countdown and you can pull this up and we'll show you the actual date time object as it was. And this is to help me with debugging so I can see what the thing was, uh, but it's hidden. So you won't be able to see it. It's not actually rendered there, but it's physically in the DOM. Uh, and then, so our countdown timer component Oh, so we've got the show duration. The show duration is basically an hour long. Uh, every show, that's what we try to time box ourselves to. So that's what we have the, uh, the implementation being. And then we have our show time. This is the time that we have scheduled the show to start. And then we have a callback that says whether or not the show is starting. And we've got a navigation manager. And this is the navigation manager is where the insanity started because we ended up in infinite loops. We were trying to get cute with our countdown logic to say, uh, once the show is starting, we're gonna actually reroute to ourselves right back to index. We're gonna force our page to reload. And the reason we were gonna do that is because then we would say, oh, now the show is starting and we're gonna embed the, the, the Twitch stream, right? So then we've got our date time service. We have the time remaining. We have got a CSS class, and this is just a placeholder for um, imminent, like the show is imminent. And we've got our date time. That's our evaluation for the actual, uh, the difference in the date time, like for what it is right now versus the, the show time itself. And so when we start our counter timer, we're actually using a, uh, a system. I think this is a threading timer. Let me pull it up. No, a system timer. So system timers, like this is like a legit .NET component model system timer, right? And it's crazy that you can use that. Uh, so we're using that timer and we have uh, an elapsed um, event and we wired to that with the on timer elapsed uh, event handler. And we do our async void because um, this is actually before I talked with Sam Harwell, that's a, another segue, but in fact, you should not be using async void even for event handlers. That, that was like the longest uh, running thing where, you know, the only exception was with event handlers, but now uh, that's not even true. And we're, we're not going to change our suggestions though. But so that's a, an aside message me if you want more information on that. Uh, so, uh, so we've got our uh, time zone information and we're going to convert uh, the time now to the central time zone because that's where we live and that's what we care about, I guess. And we're going to do some uh, evaluations on that. So the show time minus that time, uh, that's the time remaining. And this is what's really neat about this being server side. This is, I guess, one of the advantages because it's server side, this time is actually synchronized for every single client, right? If you had different clients that were running WebAssembly, you would actually end up with slight variances in that countdown timer. But with this way, you don't. It's kind of crazy. Um, so we're going to say re-enable timer and uh, look at whether or not we've already started. So this is if the show is over, the show duration is uh, actually the time remaining is greater than the duration of the show duration. 
um, and we're going to stop the timer and unregister the handler. And then we're going to navigate to the index. That means the show's over and we're going to tick over and kind of re relay out our, our next featured show, which would be at that point, six days and 23 hours away. Um, else if the show has already started or has not started, uh, uh what was my logic here? If the show has not started and it's already started, then we're going to basically, we're going to signal that the show is starting now. Um, else if it hasn't already started, this is where, like I said, the logic just gets a mess and I admit this and I need help. Help me send help, please help. Uh, but this is where all the bugs were and I've, I've got them worked out now. It, it works, uh, but it's not beautiful. Uh, so it starts in 30 seconds. So now this is when we'll actually embed the, the stream, uh, reversed the enrage extension method because why not? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Someone just shared that they reversed the extension method. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so if, uh, I encourage everyone to go watch the, the .NET docs .dev show just before our show to see this actually running in production. Cause what happens is, uh, 90 seconds out, we start blinking and then 30 seconds out, we overlay our embed for the Twitch stream. And then after the show is done, we'll actually restart the show or re renavigate to the index and the show will just basically update all the layouts and then it's the next show. So it's, it's entirely neat. But the thing is, if you actually hit F5 manually, it doesn't show you the, the, the embed thing at all. So there's opportunities for improvement, but this was the source of many bugs because what was happening was when the show was started, there was a flaw in the logic and it kept forcing the thing to do like an infinite reloop where it was navigating back to itself for that entire hour that the show would be on. And we were crashing ourselves <laughs> and it was not, it was funny. It was really entertaining. It's like, Oh my God. So I'm well, sitting here. It gave us an opportunity to make fun of you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, it. That in our Twitter account, which I'm hoping he talks about at some point. Well, yeah. All right. Hey, real quick, before we go into that, I do want to share. So, so McNerdy is, is the one that, that, that reversed the, the, the in range extension method. I yeah. really like what, what McNerdy is did. I want to show it real quick. Yeah. Show it. Um, I am going to share uh, mine. All right. Yep. That's right. So, yeah. No, he so he he uh, uh, yeah, yeah, changed yeah. the extension method around a little bit so that the syntax works out like this, so that you have the 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 number first, and then the is in range, and then you provide yes. the range as the parameter. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Tur uh, zoom in on that a little bit, because other people it's kind of hard to see. I like it. So basically, yeah, you're extending int rather than uh, the range itself, which is awesome. I love it. That makes a lot more sense because I could say um, date dot day is in range and give it the range. Beautiful. Cool. Thank you for that. I'm going back to your your screen, Dave. Is that new for Visual Studio 2019? The range stuff? Uh, no, I think range was actually introduced in C sharp eight. No, think, eight, or maybe seven one. I think he's talking about three, Visual. Three. I think he's talking about the Visual Studio styling, though. Oh, oh, uh, he's talking about your uh, your. Font. Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, I get, I get that a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the the font I use, um, I don't use Cascadia. That's the Microsoft one. I actually use um, ba, 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 ba. I use uh, Fira. Where the hell is it? Ba, ba, fonts, fonts. Press buttons, hope for the best. Click. Wow, it's really slow. It doesn't like my streaming and my audio and all this. Fire or Fira code. There's actually an open source repository uh, repository for it, and it gives you all of these beautiful uh, programming ligatures. Like you can say arrow, da -da, or no, double arrow that, or maybe not. Maybe it doesn't do anything. Maybe I'm lying. I think um, if how about this? If not. Uh, true is not equal to if you do not equal right equal false but see how it changes that into like that little funky looking slash thingy and mm -hmm. that's real that's that's a, a bang and then and then an equal sign and i'll show you boom uh what does it do for papa on nested generics um oh that's uh, it, 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 it went it, it, nothing it doesn't do anything I mean, so it's like a task of uh oops actually come on man let me type this will you 
value task. Do I have that in context or no? No, no, nothing. Oh. Um, and then another, let's just say, which would I enumerable of T uh, int. It, it, it doesn't do anything. Um, David, uh, so McNerdius had the .NET Fiddle example, and that made me think of something that might be worth sharing with folks here. Um, mm -hmm. So if you are interested in playing around with things like the new C-Sharp 9 features, um, Ooh, David can yeah. show you Sharp Lab. Yeah, yeah, Sharp Lab. Oh, this is sexy. Um, let me actually let me show you something else then. That, that's a really good point. Uh, pa, 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 pa. Let me pull up my Twitter. I want to show you this because it's I have a Sharp Lab that I created in Twitter, which was a lot of fun. Um, come on, on on your Twitter, that's not 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 our shared Twitter that you broke. We'll get oh, there. Yeah. We, we keep right. nudging him in that direction. He'll, right. he'll talk about it eventually. You All right. You guys start sharing that story. I'm going to pull up this this Sharp Lab real quick. So um, what was it? We, I guess we were, we, we were like, oh, well, we need to like make whatever changes we need to make to our account so that it's it's eligible to be verified, right? Because everybody wants the, the, the little blue check mark on Twitter. Um, so Dave looked up some doc somewhere that, that said, okay, you have to have like your name and your date of birth and all this other stuff on your account. So he goes in and, and we're, we're all, we're, we're all on, on a team's call together. He's like, okay, so my name is David Pine. What's my date of birth? Uh, well, let me see this account started. When did we start this account? We started in, in like May. All right. So my date of birth was May 3rd. And as soon as he clicked submit, we were locked out of our own Twitter account because he's underage. <laughs> yeah, they're like, you can't be five months old and try to have a Twitter account, you asshole. I'm like, how is a five year old or a five month old even typing? Like, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Tripper coach. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so sharplab.io. This is a beautiful website put together by uh, uh, Andre. Andre on. This, this individual, Ash Mind at Twitter. That's who you want to go. Uh, but basically, they have this awesome drop down, and these are all of the Roslyn branches. So you actually get the C Sharp compiler versioned inside a browser experience, and you can write C Sharp code targeting any of these branches. So you can test out any of the new features. It's literally insane. It's a beautiful, beautiful system. Or you can just go to some of the default ones, or you can look at different platforms and things like that. It's amazing. I literally love this website. Ever since Jared Parsons from the C Sharp uh, compiler team showed it to me, I have been like fascinated with it. Um, but so, for example, I've got C Sharp nine top level statements here. And top level statements allow me to avoid the boilerplate of like a program and a main entry point. So I can just do here's my using and then I can start doing coding. It's almost like C Sharp scripting, right? And then you can specify whether or not you want to run, which is experimental, and it will output things over here. Or you can say you just want it to be C Sharp compiled. And what does it look like when the C Sharp compiler takes it and what's it do? So this is what it looks like, right? You get this kind of funky looking uh, dollar sign uh, program in main because that's what the, the top level statements do for you. Uh, what about the IL? If you want to see the intermediate, uh, the intermediate language, what does that actually uh, compile down to, right? Or the... Uh, JIT ASM or the syntax tree or an explanation like it's really really cool right and the explanation shows you exactly like basically statements from here's the docs that correspond to this here's this is using name of this is an expression uh, it's really really well done this website is awesome I'm super happy with it and I use it all the time uh, so this is a neat little thing that I wanted to add to the the .NET runtime that didn't yet exist and uh David Fowler actually told me that they were that uh, they wanted to do it, but they didn't do it. But I I looked at ranges and I thought to myself, ranges they should be an implementation of uh, I enumerable, but they're not. So you can't uh, you know for each over a range. And I thought that was the stupidest API decision ever. Right? If we have a range of one to ten, and we say one dot dot ten, that's one through nine because it's end exclusive. Uh, but we should be able to enumerate over that. And there should be like, a right? Yes. Someone says, yes, thank you. Why not make them uh, I enumerable? So I said, why not have an enumerable range? And what I did, I was able to show that off here in Sharp IO Lab 
what it would look like. So I say we've got a public class that's enumerable range. It implements um, I enumerable of int and I enumerable, and we have this range enumerator, and that's uh, we have a constructor here that's private, and we're given a range, and we instantiate a, a range enumerator, and we actually do this with tuple deconstruction in assignment, so we can express that as a single single line for our constructor rather than having you know uh, brackets and then the range equals range and then uh, range enumerator equals new range enumerator and then end. Uh, squiggly brackets. So, I mean, you can simplify that if you want. Uh, we also have some old stuff here. This is the implicit operator. This is very underutilized, in my opinion. A lot of people aren't familiar with this. So I always try to call attention to it so that you can say public static implicit operator. And this is actually the type. So rather than a function name, we're saying that we're going to return an enumerable range, that is ourselves, given a range. So we say that's expressed as uh, a new enumerable range given this range instance. And our implementations of the enumerator are the range enumerator and same thing there. And our two string, we're gonna rely on the range two string, which does this beautiful little syntax um, for the range itself when it's two string. And we've got a nested class, which is the range enumerator. Uh, and we basically handle reverse and um, whether or not we're incrementing or decrementing. And what that looks like is we can say our range, this is a range uh, literal, is implicitly converted to uh, our enumerable range type. So we've got an ascending range and we have a descending range. And now we can actually for each over those because those are proper implementations of I enumerable, <laughs> right? So then you can uh, iterate over it and it says for each of the ascending, this through this. So 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, blah, 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 blah. And to show you it's real, we can just change this and make it like 37, right? And then this updates instantly. Uh, but this is supposed to be an exclusive. So there's a little bit of, of bugs in this one. And then, <laughs> the other things are with master, they actually have um, their, their master branch. If you were to go to this, I haven't done it yet, but you can actually update this. They actually have extension methods that exist uh, in the context uh, of making things like implicitly implementing other types. So rather than having like this full on class and all of this heavy lifting here, you can have an extension method, which what I, that's what I was trying to go with anyways, is an extension method on range that says, here's the get enumerator for it. Cause that's all for each really needs. But anyways, that's sharp, sharp lab IO, um, check it out. And uh, that's Azure. We're going to close that down and that's the website. And then uh, this is the code. And I mean, we're getting close to our time box. So, um, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, we're, we're loving it. We're loving it, man. Yeah, yeah. So we have a question here. Uh, wait, we have an extension get enumerator two now. Uh, yes, uh, with C sharp nine, you will be able to use extension methods that will uh, implicitly allow for those sorts of things. So you'll be able to in C sharp nine extend. Um, uh, range and have an extension method for it. And then it will be able to be for eachable, right? You'll be able to handle that all there. So it's, yeah, it's, it's getting, uh, the language is really improving and I'm super happy with it. David, a uh, question people might be wondering, maybe you know the answer is .NET 5 required to use um, C Sharp 9? Yes. I think that's one of those other things. So with .NET 5, uh, both C sharp nine and F sharp five, um, they're going to start going kind of hand in hand. So as you see, as you start seeing the, like the, the progression of .NET, another thing to mention is like the cadence, the ship cadence for .NETs. So when .NET five comes out, you might notice that Microsoft keeps saying .NET five wave. And the reason they're saying wave is because it's intended to kind of be markety in the sense that it's going to extend for more than just November, right? So the wave is from uh, November into uh, up, up to next November, which is going to be um, .NET 6. And the reason is, is because there's going to be changes. There's going to be improvements. There's going to be things that break along the way. And then just like with any product, um, this first one in November here is not going to be LTS, uh, but .NET 6 is going to be LTS long-term support. So with every next iteration or, or rev of the proper uh, .NET version, 
you're going to get uh, updates to languages. Awesome. Well, I think that sounds like a fantastic way to kind of wrap this up. I want to say thank cool. you to you guys so much. This was fantastic. We loved having you here. Love drilling into the code in, in the Blazor there. Obviously, there are probably more questions that people have at this point in time. If you have them, forward them to either me or David or Cam or Scott, um, and we'll continue to answer those. I mean, I got some more questions I'm going to talk to you guys about too later. <laughs> so, um, but beyond that, uh, we have obviously we have next month's meeting set up. I think we've got uh, uh, another one already scheduled later this year. Um, you can look at the Mad.net website. Um, but if there are people who are on here that want to talk about particular things to Mad.net in a virtual sense, uh, let me know. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great experience. And it also gives you a timeline. You can set yourself a, a, a date that you have to have a presentation by. Um, so uh, timelines are a good thing. Uh, but beyond that, um, I want to wish everyone an excellent night. I hope everyone is in good health. Uh, as always, if anyone needs anything that I can help with, please let me know. Um, but again, thank you to you guys, and I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, and uh, please uh, come visit us on Monday uh, when we have John Ski. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Yep. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.